You gentlemen and tradesmen who ride about at will, look down on these poor people, it's in off to mac your grill. Look down on these poor people. Welcome back, my friends. Philip Campbell here. And this is uh, lecture number seven on Hilaire Belloc's classic 1912 work, The Servile State. In this lecture, we're going to cover quite a bit of ground. We're going to be looking at chapters six and seven of The Servile State. Now, chapter six starts off with Belloc uh, setting up the question of what are the solutions to the instability of capitalism. He's, he's set up the argument that capitalism is inherently unstable and seeks to resolve itself into a stable state. An unstable substance seeks equilibrium, seeks uh, balance. So he says that capitalism, which is inherently unstable, must move towards a state of stability, of equilibrium. And what are the possibilities to reach this uh, state of equilibrium? Well, there's only three. There's uh, the restoration of property, there is socialism, or there's slavery. These are Belloc's three alternatives, and he, he's quite adamant that there is no fourth way. Every other option is just a subcategory of either slavery, socialism, or property. So the problem hinges on uh, control of the means of production. Now remember, uh, according to Belloc, capitalism is a situation in which everybody is politically free, but only a few individuals uh, relative to the rest of the population have access to the means of production. And uh, this is what leads to that instability. So you have two issues here. You have the political freedom of all, or, and the limited uh, property ownership of a few. So you have the political freedom of all and the limited property ownership of a few. So how do we resolve the instability in the system? Well, we only have two factors, freedom and, uh, and ownership. So um, either, either the ownership of a few has to change or the freedom of all has to change. One of those two factors has to change. We must either get rid of restricted ownership or we must get rid of freedom. Now, um, Belloc will say that we're not going to transition from capitalism rate to slavery. He says we're going to probably go through collectivism first because nobody will come right out and say, oh, okay, the, the solution to the economic problems is, is slavery, right? Nobody is going to advocate for that. Men would resist it if it was just put to them right now, hey, we need to go back to, to slavery. So the reformers, the, uh, the social justice warriors, rather, will look to modify the other factor. They won't try to touch freedom. They'll try to touch ownership of, of property. So let's say we're going to reform the institution of property, Belloc's argument goes. Uh, how can we do this? Well, there's really only two options. We have, right now, remember, in capitalism, we have the ownership of property by a few. So if we don't like that, there's only two other directions we can go. We can distribute property and have it into the hands of many, or we can put it into the hands of no one. Either many more people can have access to property or no one can have access to property. And by none, by the elimination of private property, what Belloc means is that the control of the means of production is vested in the hands of the state. Um, so there's no private control of the means of production. Let's read what Belloc says here. In chapter 6, uh, he says, this is page 65, he says, In the concrete, to put property in the hands of none means to vest it as a trust in the hands of political officers. If you say that the evils proceeding from capitalism are due to the institution of property itself, and not to the disposition of the many by the few, then you must forbid the private possession of the means of production, any particular and private part of the community to any particular and private part of the community, but someone must control the means of production or we would have nothing to eat. So in practice, this doctrine means the management of the means of production by those who are the public officers of the community. Whether these officers are themselves controlled by the community or not has nothing to do with the solution on its economic side. The essential point to grasp is that the only alternative to private property is public property. Somebody must see to the plowing and must control the plows, otherwise no plowing would be done. It is equally obvious, on the other hand, so he's argued that 
One solution is to eliminate private property altogether. That would be socialism tending towards communism. On the other hand, though, he goes on on page 66, it is equally obvious that if you conclude property in itself be no evil, but only the small number of its owners, then your remedy is to increase the number of those owners. Okay, so you've got the problem, private property owned by a few. If the problem is that the property is private, then you want to make it all public. You want to go for socialism or communism. But on the other hand, if the problem is not private property, but rather the fact that it's concentrated uh, too much in the hands of a few, then the solution is to, uh, is to have there be more owners of the property. In other words, again, either uh, put property in the hands of the many or put it into the hands of no one. Now, putting property in the hands of no one, that is to vest it in control of the state, that is known as uh, the collectivist state, Belloc calls it, or socialism. Whereas increasing the number of owners is the proprietary state, or distributism. Now, moving into the next chapter, chapter 7, Belloc will say between these two solutions, the collectivist state or the proprietary state, socialism or distributism, he said the collectivist solution is easiest. This is because it is, uh, it's easier to jump to collectivism from our current state in, in the capitalist system. However, he says it is collectivism that will eventually lead to slavery. Now, the great irony here is Belloc points out that socialism slash communism is actually way less practical than distributism. The reason is nobody has ever attained a pure socialist economy. It has just been talked about, it's been idealized, but pure socialism has never been successfully achieved. Distributism, however, which, which critics say is, is, is pie in the sky, idealism, it's never going to happen, it's unrealistic, it's unworkable. On the contrary, a proprietary society is very practical because Europe actually did have it for centuries in the Middle Ages and the early modern period. And, uh, and I would add to Belloc's argument that the early colonial United States prior to the Industrial Revolution was also a proprietary society. So it's ironic. People say proprietary distributism is unrealistic when in reality it has functioned successfully for centuries. People think socialism is more realistic, but it's actually less practical because it's never been successfully tried. Now, uh, nevertheless, though, despite the fact that socialism is way less practical in a certain sense, in another sense, Belloc argues it's more practical because men will turn to socialism much more readily because it's easier to transition from our current point to socialism. For example, say we have a very large, uh, a very large uh, industry, say the airline industry, okay? Say we want to socialize the airline industry. Well, it's relatively easy. The government simply comes in and they buy out the, the private owners of the airline industry and then they bring in their own government management or they, they keep the same management, only now they work for the government instead of for Spirit Airlines or United Airlines. Basically, it's the same sort of management style, the same operation, the same everything, only different people in, in charge. Now, imagine how different that would be if rather than going towards a socialist solution, we adopted a distributist solution uh, where we would uh, create multiple owners of that airline industry. Belloc says that, uh, this is on page 69 of chapter 7, when a private company or water company or tramway line or, or some industry is bought by the government and worked thereafter in the interests of the public, the transaction is affected without any perceptible friction, disturbs the life of no private citizens, and seems in every way normal. In other words, if the government was to buy out that airline, what practically would change other than who the owner was? The very, the very mode of conducting business would still stay the same. However, he continues, upon the contrary, the attempt to create a large number of shareholders in such enterprises and artificially to substitute many partners distributed throughout the great number of the population in place of the original few capitalist owners, that would prove lengthy and at every step would arouse opposition, would create disturbance, would work at the expense of great friction, and would be imperiled by the power of the new and many owners to sell again to the few. So imagine if we we're going to take that airline and break it up and try to 
try to uh, give, make it a cooperative owned by all the workers and, and all the workers would suddenly have a say in its management, that would be a much bigger undertaking and cause a lot more friction. In other words, what he says, the man who desires to reestablish property on a distributive basis is working against the current of how things currently are. Whereas the person who wants to move towards collectivism is working with the current. So how then could we reestablish uh, property and establish distributism? Belloc actually says he is against, I mean, we could just pass law. We could just say, forget it. We're just going to confiscate everything and break it up and redistribute it. Now, this is very important. Belloc is in favor of distributism, but not redistributism. He is not in favor of seizing wealth and redistributing it. And people need to get this straight. Uh, many times you talk about distributism and people think redistribution of wealth. Oh, that's socialism. Distributism is the opposite of socialism. Belloc says here, how can we establish the proprietary state? He says, quote, this is page 70, I might boldly confiscate and redistribute at a blow. But by what process should I choose the new owners? Even supposing there was some machinery whereby justice of the new distribution could be assured, how could I avoid the enormous and innumerable separate acts of injustice that would attach to general redistribution? To say none shall own and confiscate is one thing. To say all should own and apportion ownership is another. Action of this kind would so disturb the whole network of economic relations as to bring ruin at once to the whole body politic and particularly to the smaller interests individually affected. In a society such as ours, a catastrophe falling upon the state from the outside might indirectly do good by making that redistribution possible, but no one working from within the state could provoke that catastrophe without ruining his own cause." End quote. So Belloc is not in favor of any sort of redistributive scheme where the government confiscates uh, property and forcibly uh, redistributes it to, uh, to other owners. He, he says that would bring about the ruin of the economy and the distributist cause. Well, what if, we, what if we just proceed slowly? What if we do here a little, there a little? We, we work by not confiscating and redistributing, but by trying to gradually change the laws uh, by, by buying out uh, slowly, by doing it uh, in, a more, uh, in a more gentler way. He says, in that case, quote, what forces of inertia and custom I have to work against today in capitalist society. Um, in other words, the effects you're going to have are so little, it's like you might as well be, you know, like dumping bottled water in the ocean and claiming that you're contributing to the volume of water, <laughs> right? You're making, are you making a difference? Yes. Is it, uh, is it uh, negligible? Yes. So um, the problem is a moral one then. He, he says the problem is really a moral problem. It's about a mindset. We are, we are conditioned to a capitalist mindset. Belloc asks the, uh, he asks the most pertinent question on page 71. And this is at the heart uh, of that every, every person who wants this proprietary society must ask themselves, Will men even want to be owners? Even if we could create this society, have we been so uh, accustomed to the way things are, w will men even want the restoration of property? Is there a strong enough tradition of property left to ensure a cooperative instinct? Um, he says, quote, on page 71, the strongest force against the distribution of ownership in society already permeated with capitalist modes of thought is still the moral one. Will men want to own? Will officials, administrators, and lawmakers be able to shake off the power which under capitalism seemed normal to the rich? Uh, if you wanted to establish a proprietary cooperative ownership of a company, would the average worker even be interested in that? Or would he just say, look, just give me my paycheck. I don't want to think about it. Just, just pay me. Let me go home and drink my beer and party on the weekend, right? Um, is that tradition, uh, that, that custom of the intrinsic dignity of ownership still alive in our society? We have to ask ourselves that. So in short, the arguments of, of chapters six and seven are that it would be much uh, easier to transition to collectivism straight from capitalism rather than, uh, than to a distributist model. Now, this is why even many, many socialists and communists 
uh, say that the transition to collectivism is inevitable. Uh, Marx said that the evolution of capitalism to communism was, was inevitable and inexorable and, and absolutely uh, a certain fact of, of history. Belloc, however, says that this drive towards collectivism will get diverted. Yes, it will be easier to push from capitalism to collectivism, but we're not going to get a collectivist state. The energies, if you will, of the push to collectivism will get diverted. The, the flow of the river, we talked about the current going with the current versus against, against it. That current will get diverted down an unexpected channel, which is leading towards not the collectivist state, but the servile state. So in our, next, uh, in our next lecture, on chapter 8, we're going to see the, the actual mechanics of why Belloc thinks both the reformers and the reformed are preparing the way for the servile state. The God of old will bring your pride quite down, you tyrants of England, your race may soon be wrong. You may be brought into account for what you've surely done.